All right, so we have one more session this morning uh, for you. And this is Myrna, who is going to come and talk about um, area-based coordination in Yemen. Myrna, can I have a hello? Hi, good morning. You can hear me okay? Perfect. Can hear you well, thanks. Okay, great. So I'm going to share my screen, um, and then I'm going to quickly hand it over to, to Petra, who's going to kind of kick things off for us uh, as we get going this morning. Um, so Petra, are you there? Yes. Hi. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Mirna. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from Yemen. Uh, I am Petra, the RC CCCM coordinator. Uh, me, Kat, and Mirno are very, very pleased and excited to have this opportunity to share with all of you our experience in operationalization of the ABA approaches in Yemen, West Coast specifically. Um, Mirno is our, and we are very pleased to have here Mirno, who is our advocacy advisor, previously our area based coordinator for the West Coast and uh, CCCM project manager. And Kate, our area based coordinator currently uh, for the West Coast for DRC. Um, following up on multiple discussions globally and even with the CCCM clusters position on area based approaches, I'll share with you an overview of why ABA proves essential in Yemen-like displacement settings. Um, Mirno and Kat uh, will bring the first-hand experience of what worked for us in the West Coast, but we will be also looking for recommendations and opportunities on how to strengthen uh, the CCCM ABA and overall coordination within the humanitarian cluster system. Um, slide, please. Thank you. So firstly, let's look on why ABA become necessary uh, for Yemen type of displacement. What was the rationale for its application and how does it fit into the overall structure? As of May, 2021, an estimated 1 million displaced Yemenis have settled across more than 1,696 spontaneous unplanned sites and um, the locations, population size, and characteristics of these sites change over time as the conflict progresses. More than half of the sites are not reached by the humanitarian actors. Uh, displacements are scattered across areas. They are diverse in its size, and in some cases spread and scattered also across the host communities. West Coast is a great example of such. The CCCM cluster in Yemen um, the overall structure of uh, the Yemen uh, setup is the system cluster in Yemen based in Sana has six regional coordination mechanisms, subnational clusters, uh, which are supported by 13 area based coordinators. At the moment, uh, the system cluster has 21 partners, and uh, according to our 2021 strategy, we will strive to identify more partners in each governorate to enhance coordination through area based approach appropriate. So how does the area-based coordinator fit in? The role of the area-based coordinator fits into the system to address holistically needs of IDP sites surrounding areas to extend possible, which are smaller than a coordination hub, but larger than a single IDP site, which basically means services at site and area level. Um, slide, please. Um, this structure was inevitable because of a large number of uncovered sites and needs. Again, West Coast is a great example of that. Um, hence, ABA aims to facilitate coordination of services also at unmanaged sites, but also to identify linkages with partners, host communities, and ministries holistically, and to promote the best system practices among partners within designated geographical area that's in line with the system position on ABA and also our CCCM Yemen cluster strategy. Um, slide, please. Thank you. The CCCM area based coordinator should fall in line to support the subnational coordinator and also to coordinate with OCHA at the relevant level. Uh, coordinators may have direct links to OCHA on behalf of the cluster and partners, and the system in itself aims not only to deliver a holistic approach, but as you can see, also to strengthen effectiveness of the coordination mechanism in itself. 
Um, as a case study of system referral and escalation system also showcases, uh, the role um, should also directly fit into the referral, into the escalation and referral system in Yemen. Whereas through area-based approach, the area-based coordinator should act as the first level of referrals for the respective geographical area. Slide, please. And uh, because of the nature of the contextualized uh, development, because of the nature of displacement, large displacement, lack of coverage, very scattered uh, services across the areas, it was inevitable and it organically evolved into the area-based approach, which has been also integrated into our 2021 system cluster strategy. Slide, please. So how did it look in practice though? And how was it contextualized? The adaptation across governorates differed. Um, while it's essential to acknowledge needed adaptation and context contextualization of the approach, this was not always a result of necessity, but also as a response to challenges which we have faced buying from multiple stakeholders. And Kate and Mirna will be able to give much more specific insights. Um, but overall, as the RC uh, being uh, area-based coordinators for three different areas, uh, we have faced multiple level of engagement as area-based coordinators. Why? Um, the system was very people-driven. Uh, in some areas, we have faced uh, limited buying from partners. Um, in other areas, we have faced um, limited acceptance from the authorities, but also in the West Coast where the system worked very successfully, we still have faced multiple challenges and we still have uh, lots of room for improvement um, to legitimize the role of the area-based coordinator. This is essential to strengthen understanding of the area-based approach among multiple stakeholders with clearly defined DORs. But um, <laughs> enough said, Let's move on to more specific example of the West Coast to show how the ABA happened organically, um, how the theory worked in practice, and what are the further opportunities we can seek to strengthen the area-based approaches and the, our coordination mechanism. Over to you, Mino. Great, thank you, Petra. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about the West Coast. Um, as Petra mentioned, I was, I was the first area coordinator on the West Coast, and then Kat is now the current area coordinator on the West Coast. So I think it'd be great to kind of look at how it's developed uh, over time. So just quickly, a little bit of contextual overview. So the West Coast has, you know, a lot of various sites, 80 plus, um, ranging from 10 households to 900 households, it's about the, the largest. And, and these sites are very scattered amongst urban and remote settings. The, the lines between Oak Community and IDP are very, very blurred at best. Uh, coordination, we coordinate, the area coordinator coordinates across four different districts, but really direct access to only two of those districts. Um, the authorities had very little engagement uh, with, with the humanitarian sector when we started. Uh, so generally, the way the authorities would assert their dominance and show the population that they are in control was generally to restrict uh, access. It was, it was the only thing that they had, uh, only card that they could play to kind of show their, their relevance. Uh, the West Coast had very, very few agencies present when we started. But sorry, this is back in early 2019. Um, most agencies were doing these hit and run activities, building latrines, but no maintenance, no hygiene promotion, very little soft activities, distributions with them leaving. Oftentimes, they were from partners who would send teams out for a couple of days and then they would leave. Uh, so quite very, very limited um, agencies. There was no UN actors either. Um, UN, either cluster or OCHA, whoever would, would arrive between six and eight weeks, depending on security. Oftentimes visits were canceled. They always had armed escorts, which meant that it was always a bit of a tense uh, environment when they came. Uh, so it was really challenging to have kind of uh, UN and your traditional coordinators around. And, and then from the very, or very early on, we saw that there was a lot of missed opportunities and linkages that we could link up the IDP and host community response that we could link up the various uh, activities of all the other, of all the actors that were working there. Um, so the cluster began in 2018. Uh, 
2018, but it didn't really, CCM cluster, it did not really, um, it was still part of the shelter in a five cluster until middle, around the middle of 2019. Uh, and the first, you know, our first attempt as CRC out on the West Coast, where we were asked to focus on the four main sites. Uh, like I mentioned, there are 80 plus sites. And that very easily, obviously, created tension because, you know, services were being focused on only a few sites and the other sites were coming into planning and, and everyone knows everyone knows the story. Uh, so we, we started having our meetings about every two weeks uh, in the very beginning. And what really mattered, what really kicked things off was that we did a site mapping. So at this time, there was no list of sites, uh, no how many households, no locations, nothing. Uh, so we, we used this tool and our teams went out and mapped out all the sites. And then every meeting we would project this map up on the up on the wall. And whenever we talked about a site or an area, we would zoom into that area. Finally, we had common names for all the sites. We didn't argue about what this site was called this or what or whatever. Um, and it really started to, and I think that example was really important because it showed people that coordination can be helpful, that we can use this information that can make their work easier. Um, if you're a national partner, participating in assessments means that maybe your logo gets put on the outcome of the assessment, you start to get some attention. Uh, and that was really, that was really the key thing, was just mapping those things out and then really forcing that uh, into every meeting, everything that we did. And our meetings grew very quickly. So we had lots of participation from authorities. That's at least 30% of all of our members coming to meetings were authority figures, Minister of Water, Minister of Education, representatives from all the different districts. Uh, and I think that was because it was the only forum that they had to engage with humanitarian actors, to engage with resources, to try to, uh, they were not organized themselves. So this was the one time that they could actually all come together. And I think that was really, was really critical. Um, and how the meetings would work was that we would, you know, run a meeting, whatever, and then we would have various bilateral thematic meetings that came off of that meeting. So, you know, a meeting about education, a meeting about water, about whatever it might be we have the thematic meetings. Because we had no designated cluster partners, the area coordinator, we would facilitate those meetings. So we would you know, set the date and time uh, and the venue, we would send out the invite, we would set the agenda, and then our teams would go. And even if it was a meeting on health, and CRC did not do health, our teams would be there, or I would be there, we would co-facilitate with the Minister of Health or whoever wanted to be part of the meeting. Uh, and we would write up minutes and we would take action points. And the minutes were always taken in English and Arabic. And then when we came back together on a monthly basis, now because it's so many thematic meetings, uh, we would review all those action points together. So all those thematic meetings really led into the monthly level uh, area meeting. Everyone came back. Uh, and those meetings were hectic and you know difficult, but I think uh, the people seeing that the meetings were connected uh, and they would minutes in English and Arabic, and that we like arduously went through all the action points every single time. Uh, it, it started to, you know, we all kind of started to figure out together how it was best going to work. Uh, and that's kind of how things kicked off. Um, and I just wanted to run through a few of the relationships. Uh, so I mentioned the authorities. So the authorities, you know, I think the main authorities that we coordinated with there became a little bit of solidarity because they saw us and themselves struggling to coordinate everyone. And that kind of brought us together because of that challenge. And, and to do that early on was, was really important. And as I mentioned before, this is the first time that authorities really had access to, to partners and resources because uh, they had no other way that they were going to engage the humanitarian community. Our relationship with OCHA, and it's something I'll touch upon later as well, and the beginning was very good. I think OCHA realized that they had very little access out there. They had a great focal point that was responsible for the West Coast that, you know, he realized that he did not have the relationships or the contextual knowledge. And so they referred a lot of those things to us. And, and the key point about this was that although we were appointed by the CCM cluster, we were not coordinating only in-site services. That made no sense. We coordinated everything. It was a geographical split. We focused on this area. Regardless, if it was insight, out of sight, host community, IDP, didn't matter. We coordinated everything because that was the only thing that made sense at the time. Um, and that split was really mutually beneficial because we were on the ground we, and we knew the actors, we knew the context, we could coordinate a lot much more effectively because we had an operational team that could carry out assessments and do things that we needed to do. We fed all that information up to OCHA. And because OCHA was not trying to do that, uh, and if they did, they would not be able to do it very well, what that meant was that the coordination was working and people got buy-in, but also OSHA had this superiority 
you know, aura around them. They were too, they were too senior to be deciding where kits went when the rain hit. Uh, and that meant that when we had really tough pressures from the authorities on access or principles, we could refer them up to OCHA and OCHA would step in and help solve those. It gave us more space to operate. And then when OCHA needed that information or needed help coordinating things on the ground, we would step in and do that. And I think that really fed us very well. We had this really nice relationship. Uh, and that made sense. Uh, with the clusters, we had, you know, some difficult times, uh, I'd say. Uh, I think there was, uh, there was not a lot of communication on what the air coordinator was responsible for, uh, who the referrals could go to. So we'd get a lot of pushback from clusters and we'd raise issues. And who are you? Why are you contacting me? Stuff like this. Uh, but clusters weren't there. The clusters that were there, which Henley Wash had a guy that was responsible. We, it worked out really well. Uh, he would lead the Wash thematic meetings. He came to all the meetings. We would attend his meetings. Uh, and I think that you know, on the ground actors, we were able to build that relationship and really, really move it forward. Um, and then the organizations, yeah, uh, just quickly, like, I think the national partners saw that they had an opportunity to engage with the wider humanitarian clusters, uh, when normally they, they wouldn't have that opportunity, because a lot of these national partners maybe did not have access to the cluster meetings at the national or subnational level, or did not feel that they had access to them, or their field staff didn't have that access, and now their field staff had a voice, and there were only a few actors, so if you came to the meeting, you had a voice in the meeting, I think that was really important. Uh, and just quickly, you know, I think one of the early examples, you know, we had water diarrhea cases in some of the some of the sites. Our teams picked up on them, referred it to the Minister of Health. They sent out a team, confirmed the cases, but then they coordinated with the checkpoints to allow families to to move through the checkpoints at any time during the day to act. There's only one health facility that they could access. And then we ran a somatic meeting uh, with all the, well, there weren't really any health agencies, but just the some of the agencies that were willing to step in and help with messaging around hand washing. Um, and then we split up the areas geographically. We worked with the health ministry, aligned the messages, and then sent everyone out and then reported back at that monthly meeting. So it's just a really nice, small, kind of tight example of how that, that relationship worked uh, for us. So I'm going to hand over to Kat uh, to talk about where we are now in Wilson. Great, thanks Mirno. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, if you don't know me already, I'm Kat and I'm very sorry if you can hear the shooting that's happening <laughs> nearby today. Um, it's been on and off. So I'm currently the area-based coordinator for Southern Hodeida taking over after Mirno. Um, he gave a bit of background to you already about the area that we cover, but with the conflict constantly changing, I do wanna give you a bit of an update about what the area looks like at present. So now we have 113 sites under these four districts Hoha, Toheita, Hayes, and Jeremy. And two of them, Hayes and Jeremy, continue to be frontline areas that we can only sporadically access. So for this reason, I'm using a combination of both in-person coordination and remote updates to both advocate for the long-term needs of these districts, but also for us to respond to emergencies as they arise. There are many ways in which I see ABA as being beneficial to a response like the one that I'm covering with IDP and host community members living in the same poor conditions and in sites without any clear boundaries that are constantly evolving and mostly growing over time. So at present, we're relying on remote updates from partners to create monthly site updates, and we're holding weekly coordination meetings with local authorities and monthly sectoral or issue-focused meetings, as Mirno mentioned before, since we can't hold the large-scale ABA meetings that we want because of current COVID restrictions. Um, but just to tell you a bit about what we're doing, so in terms of WASH, as no one person can physically be present in all of these 113 sites at once, we're relying on all of our communities and partners to feed WASH needs in and out of sites, both to us as ABA, and then I directly refer these to the WASH subnational cluster. So due to the short-term nature of the funding in Yemen right now, the gaps and the maintenance needs are constant, and we're rolling out a monitoring system through COBO, of course, um, to more quickly refer, identify these gaps to existing partners. In terms of education, I advocate both for the inclusion of IDP children in existing schools in our districts through the Ministry of Education contacts, as well as work with camp management and education partners in our areas to pilot, temp pilot temporary learning spaces in our sites. Um, as education is one of the lowest funded uh, sectors in Yemen, this has required partners to be very creative and try to solve challenges on a more localized area using ABA. 
In terms of food security, as we all know, WFB has not registered um, any IDPs for GFD in now over 18 months in Yemen. There are partners with sporadic funding to provide cash for food uh, in their place. As ABA, since we have an overview of the needs both in and out of sites, we refer new arrivals as they're registered for RRM to the food security cluster for inclusion in more longer term cash for food programming. Uh, finally, also ABA does allow me to advocate for needs both on behalf of ministries and local authorities, as Mirno said, who are maybe less able to advocate for themselves through the traditional cluster system. We have been able to use our platform to advocate for the need for durable solutions to water and sanitation provision, stronger health and education services on the West Coast, and we continue to be the primary operational partner along with the executive unit, my local authority counterpart, to respond to daily emergencies on on the ground, which is nearly constant fires and flooding uh, coming in the next month. Mirno, uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so as I said, we take the lead on coordinating on operational issues, but I want to highlight a way in which the split in terms of focus has really supported everyone's work. So in April of this year, a new local office in an attempt to demonstrate their authority in our area blocked all the national and international NGOs from accessing sites through control of checkpoints. We were able to successfully raise this to OCHA in their position, which then led to advocacy efforts from their Adam level office in order to reinstate access for everyone. Having a split that allows a non-operational partner such as OCHA to advocate for these more sensitive needs has removed some of the risk from us, DRC as ABA, but also as an implementing partner. In addition, one of the things that has made ABA such a success on the West Coast is a strong buy-in from local authorities. Um, not only do they specifically request for me to call meetings, they are actively engaged and they help to really hold partners accountable when I do need additional support, which is critical. At this moment, a lot of new organizations are finally getting both funding but also access critically to begin implementing in the West Coast. And DRC, not only as ABA, but also as an operational partner in this area since 2019, has a really strong body of evidence about the current populations and the needs in the area. So one of the things that I think we have the capacity to do over these next months is to set a narrative around the needs so that new partners arriving in this area bring projects that target based on needs rather than status and also target the economic recovery and infrastructure needs of the area. Next slide, Mirno, thanks. In terms of some of the challenges of implementing ABA in Yemen, our experience from the West Coast has not really been found in many of the other districts. Depending on the area, but particularly in the north, local partners and authorities have not fully supported this model for myriad reasons. So buy-in is a really critical baseline in order to replicate this system elsewhere. Secondly, COVID-19 has made coordination at every level a challenge and this did not spare ABA. We have many national partners on the West Coast who cannot make the switch to online coordination meetings as they're lacking both in electricity and internet in their offices, which has challenged me to become more creative in how we engage them. Third, as we currently don't have a Yemen-wide endorsed TOR for ABA, I occasionally face pushback that I wanted to share um, from some subnational cluster coordinators that I work with. Uh, a recent example of this was in trying to create a referral mechanism for new arrivals on the West Coast to receive shelter. Uh, the shelter cluster said that they were not permitted to share with me information on partner stock that they had already collected information on, as ABA was not formalized in the TOR, but at the same time, they wouldn't permit me to collect information myself from the shelter partners on their current stocks. So this left our response at a standstill for several months, as you can imagine. Uh, and finally, another challenge. Um, so we're working in an area where DRC was both the ABA, but also the only CCCM provider for now three years. So as partners like IOM and NRC are starting to come into the West Coast and in our districts with plans to implement CCCM, I'm planning a series of trainings targeted at our partner organizations to help them understand the difference in our role as CCCM partner versus area-based coordinator and how they can best utilize each, um, each of us whenever they need to raise a need or a challenge. Um, next slide, Mirno. 
Thanks. Uh, so this slide demonstrates how ABA and OCHA's RCT meetings can be complementary with the split that we use on the West Coast. So I coordinate at a very localized level the needs of sites and their surrounding areas in an open process that allows for participation of local authorities and ministries, as Mirna said. Uh, meanwhile, the OCHA RCT meetings, which are held monthly, are high level discussions with one participant from each NGO covering multiple governorates and focusing on these far reaching issues such as access and durable solutions. So much higher level than what we're doing. Um, Mirna, I think now we hand it back over to you. Okay, great. Uh, I just want to finish up just so we have a couple of minutes for questions or comments that I think there's two critical or crux issues here. And the first one being that OCHA and ABA relationship. And as we mentioned, I think there's a way that this needs can be mutually beneficial to both in the ways that we mentioned before. Uh, and I think that an area coordinator, that split has to be field and non-field or geographically split. It just doesn't make sense to kind of in this context in particular, and I think also in highly secure security context, that we have inside out of site split uh, if you don't have regular access. You have, and your coordinator has to be operational. You have to have an operational team to be able to implement coordination and to demonstrate that it can work. Uh, and you have to have access all the time and you can't be restricted by security or running around with armed escorts. It just, it, it just will not work ever. I really I don't think so. Um, and I think, uh, and, and it's really important that that idea of OCHA's seniority it was so important for us because we could really refer those really tough pressing problems onto OCHA and that kept us operational space as an actor that was just operating, but also as a coordinator. And then secondly, the correct issue is what are the extent of the responsibilities? Um, so as a coordinator, you know, as, as Kat Petra mentioned, you know, we have 16, 20 sites that we do CCM programming in, but as a coordinator, we're responsible for over 100 sites. So what is the, the limitations of that responsibility? It would be good to sort out. We have some ideas, but I'm not gonna go into them. Uh, but also what's linked to this is that buying from clusters. We're raising the awareness about clusters, formalizing it, trying to make sure that people don't get super sensitive about it. And I think that's really important to link that into a technological referral system the referral system where things can be a transparent referral process where things can be put online. Everyone can see the various referrals that are coming in and that can formalize the escalation channels uh, between the different different uh, sectors. Um, okay, I'm gonna end there and see if there's any questions or comments. Uh, I'll hand over to Juan to facilitate, thanks. Thank you so much, Bano, Mano and Kat and, uh, and Petra. It's a really interesting presentation and I see some comments in the chat already. Uh, I mean, in my internal team chat, it's on fire. Everyone is uh, really interested to, to hear more about it. And I think like you flag a really important thing, like the buy-in, um, you know, from not just OCHA, but also from other clusters around how this uh, model is, is used. Um, I don't know if there are other questions. Um, I think I can share a little bit like uh, the discussion of the global cluster um, coordination group also. Um, I think one of the challenges is that even within uh, OCHA and cluster colleagues is that they, I think different contexts also see, have different understanding on what ABA is um, and how it's used and, you know, whether this is area-based coordination, you know, or is it done from CCCM side? I mean, it's, I think that's, that's a big challenge and, and you know, like I mean, big kudos. I I don't know. If you, do you have plan then to develop the TOR for the the coordinators? There has been. Sorry, if I can jump in. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, work previously, even before my era, about the TORs, and uh, there has been initial draft, but there was a bit of a back and forth. And again, it, it links to the buy-in as well and to legitimization of the. Uh, of the coordinator's role. I think it's, a uh, regardless of the cluster, I don't think necessarily we are having discussion about the need of area-based approach. I think it's very clear, regardless of the cluster, that we do have to uh, intervene holistically through multisexual approaches, that's clear. But I think sometimes conversation takes place uh, more in regard of being threatened by what it means to have the era-based coordinators under CCCM, rather than looking at the benefits of how it can actually feed into the overall system, how it can support OCHA, how it can support the shelter clusters, cluster and, uh, and others and so on. 
So this should be the, and having this into the Yemen CCTM 2021 strategy, uh, we will very strongly advocate to legitimize it and uh, clarify it as well, in addition to awareness raising, not just among us, because I think for system actors in Yemen, at least it's very clear what it means, even with the limitations and challenges, but mostly to others to explain what it means for them as well. Mm. So that will be our priority. Yeah, no, and, and I, I, I'm compl- I think we're, many of us are completely behind you on, on this front. I mean, it's great to hear that it's included as part of the country's strategy for, for this year. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and- and I, sorry to interrupt. And it would be also very helpful having the, the global CCM cluster area based approach uh, was quite helpful as well for us uh, to, to gain another momentum to, to move forward. And I think also having more of a generic global support or direction would be also helpful to help us as well to legitimize ourselves. I mean, even though I understand it's very context specific, but I think it, this type of displacement, it could be very easily replicable. Yes, no, absolutely. I, I think it's been and such a great presentation from, from all three of you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I think for those of you listening who wants to read more about it, um, Annika shared in the chat that is um, the case studies included in the, the collection that was just uh, launched this morning. So this is case study B2 um, on area-based coordination from, from Yemen.